Welcome everyone to the Alum Fellows Reading Series here at the Hutchins Center for African and African Research at Harvard University. I'm Krishna Lewis, the director of the fellowship program, and it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome Todd Carmody and Karen Tani. Alumnus fellow Todd Carmody received his doctorate in English at the University of Pennsylvania and has held postdoctoral fellowships at UC Berkeley, the Free University of Berlin, the Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies, and of course, at the Hutchins Center. His recent work has appeared in Kalalu, American Literary History, and NYU's Keywords in the Health Humanities. His first book, Work Requirements, Race, Disability, and the Print Culture of Social Welfare, was published just this past fall by Duke University. And it is this important work which is the subject of today's session. Dr. Komodi will be joined will be joined in discussion by Karen Tani. Dr. Tani is the Seaman Family University Professor at the University of Pennsylvania, where she is jointly appointed in the law school and the history department. She is the author of States of Dependency, Welfare, Rights, and American Governance, 1935 to 1972, published by Cambridge University Press. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in the Yale Law Journal, the Law and History Review, Disability Studies Quarterly, and other outlets. Her current book project is tentatively titled Costed Out, Disabled Citizens and American Governance in the Late 20th Century. She holds a JD and a PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania. We will begin with Dr. Komodi reading from work requirements, and this will be followed by a conversation between our two guests. Then the audience will be invited to comment or ask questions. Would you like to start, Todd? Sure, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. It's great to be here virtually back at the Hutchins Center. I had a very formative time there. It's important to the work of the book. And so this is very much a homecoming. So thank you so much. I'm going to speak for 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll have a, a bit of a uh, conversation here myself, and then we'll open things up. OK, so the book is called Work Requirements. And it's a book about why we assume all work, even the most patently debasing and plainly unproductive, is inherently meaningful. More particularly, it's a book about how people on the social margins have been tasked with ensuring that work is not only meaningful, but that, that it should be the very crux of our social belonging and even our humanity. These are the questions we'll be grappling with today. But to start off, I thought we might begin with two objects that help crystallize the book's core ideas and arguments. The first of which is a social media outrage that splashed through the mainstream media a few years back. And the other is a forgotten entry in the archive of black industrial education. So to the first. In the fall of 2016, Dale McLaughlin, the person on the left in this photograph, went to a busy intersection near his home in Southwest Virginia and held up a sign that read, need donations to help feed my family, God bless. McLaughlin was an unemployed white man in his 50s who had lost the full use of his right arm in a mining accident years earlier. What happened to him afterward was a common enough story in this part of Appalachia, a region hard hit by the collapse of the coal industry and the broader economic downturn. It was a story of disability, unemployment, public assistance, addiction, and jail time, a contemporary portrait of poverty in the US. McLaughlin was soon joined on the side of the road that day by a man named David Hess, who also carried a sign. I offered him a job and he refused. It's unclear how long the two men, evidently already acquainted, stood together or how drivers passing by responded. But before the day was out, Hess posted this photograph to social media. The image quickly stirred an outpouring of ridicule and anger, but also pity. And in time, local and national media took note. So to many observers, the Washington Post included, the photograph of McLaughlin and Hess captured a growing split in rural America between, quote, those who work and those who don't. At once somber and provocative, the image seemed to corroborate a spate of recent reporting of a jobless economic recovery that was transforming disability benefits, or so the argument went, into a de facto public assistance program while still leaving many people in dire need. And yet it doesn't take much digging to trouble such easy distinctions between working and not working. 
Not only could McLaughlin make more money on the street than in a low paying job, he told local media, but he also did his best to approach soliciting like any other job, holding regular hours and asking permission, permission to stand on private property. Unsurprisingly, Hess, the man on the right here, saw matters differently. He argued that quote unquote begging was the opposite of productive work and that anyone who turned down a quote real job forfeited the right to ask for help in the first place. Quote, I work, you bums should try it, end quote, he wrote on Facebook. For all his bluster, however, Hess's straight talk seems rather more torturous when we consider the job that he actually offered McLaughlin. It was, quote, promotion work that required standing on the sidewalk, twirling a sign on the model of other businesses. To condemn, Hess and his, to condemn McLaughlin as Hess and his allies did was thus to see a world of difference between twirling a sign for someone else and holding a sign of one's own. The former was work, the latter was not. But there's another way of reading this scene, of course. Social media outrage and ideological baggage notwithstanding, it seems clear that the moral chasm separating work from idleness in this photo amounts to little more than a few degrees of rotation. So for the second object or sign that helped me crystallize the book's main arguments, we need to take a, a step back a century or so and move from rural Virginia to rural South Carolina. Writing long before McLaughlin was forced to defend his work ethic on the side of the road, the black educator Martin A. Manafi was uh, described his experience at Booker T. Washington's famed Tuskegee Institute in strikingly similar terms, though with a rather more upbeat conclusion. Manafe begins his essay, A School Treasurer's Story from 1906, with a recollection of childhood injury. As a boy, he writes, I had had one of my shoulders dislocated in an accident and I've been able to use but one arm since. This impairment prevented Manafe from attending the local college, but not from enrolling at Tuskegee. Once on campus, however, he struggled with his work assignment in the brickyard and was soon forced to leave. Less than a year went by though before he returned to what he called his second trial. This time Manafi lobbied for stenography work in the front office, an assignment that allowed him to finish his studies on time and to launch a career in educational administration after he graduated. At Voorhees School, where he went on to work, Manafi worked to help build an institution that would survive, if not always thrive, in the rocky years ahead but a school treasurer's story does not dwell on any of this difficulty. Once he moved from the brick, brickyard to the front office, Manafe would have readers believe, everything else simply fell into place. So it'd be easy to conclude that McLaughlin and Manafe share little more than a personal history of impairment and injury. There's no direct comparison to be made, of course, between the social circumstances that shape life for a working class white man in the deindustrializing present and those encountered by black professionals in the early 20th century. Nor does the public attention their stories garnered seem at all similar. McLaughlin's beef notoriety in the news and outrage cycle linking social and national media drew him into a familiar morality tale of two Americas, makers and takers. Manafe's story, on the other hand, might read as an ableist tale of overcoming adversity, equal parts Booker T. Washington and Helen Keller. But as with the job McLaughlin turned down, things seem, more dif dif seem, things seem different when we consider what Manafe actually did in his career as a school treasurer. Most of his time was not spent balancing the books or doing the payroll. His main responsibility was asking donors for money. He didn't take to the street to do this, of course, but the letters, applications, and reports that he mailed out by the hundreds did take a page out of McLaughlin's book. Manafe's task was not only to present Voorhees, his new school, as a worthy cause, but to ensure potential benefactors that he was a professional fundraiser and not a quote unquote beggar. Armed with business English, Manafe thus also set out to show his work. Taken together, these two stories illustrate what is probably the most wildly, head, widely held assumption about US social welfare provision, that only people who work or are willing to work deserve help. From this commonplace follows another, that it is always easy to tell what counts as work and what doesn't. In many contexts, this statement would seem irrefutable. Either goods are produced or services rendered or they aren't. 
But the issue is thornier with social welfare provision. Whether in the antebellum poorhouse or under neoliberal workfare, the labor required of beneficiaries usually has greater moral than economic value. It matters less that anything is done or made and the recipients per persuasively perform their potential for self-reliance. What persuades in one context, however, may not in another. In the early 19th century, alm seekers could demonstrate their deservingness by breaking rocks or chopping wood, but not by selling handicrafts. The work requirements created by 1990s welfare reform can be met by caring for someone else's children, even one's nieces and nephews, but not by looking after one's own. Such arbitrary distinction suggests centuries of social policy and, and custom to the contrary, that not all work is inherently meaningful. In fact, because the non-economic value of work is defined by an ever shifting set of political, social and cultural priorities, social welfare requires ceaseless acts of representation and interpretation. Recipients strive to make their work legible as work and the powers that be assess the results. Work may be the cornerstone of social welfare provision, in other words, but it is not a self-explanatory or universal truth. Work is instead a sign to be held just so. So my book tells the story and the stakes of this unacknowledged representational project. It explores how the Sisyphean project of making work seem inherently meaningful is outsourced to people in the economic margins and mediated by institutions of social welfare. But otherwise, the book argues that work requirements are always formal requirements. There would be many ways to tell this story, of course, and the formal history of social welfare at the heart of my book is not meant to be comprehensive. Instead, the book, book focuses on how social welfare became a specifically textual project at the end of the 19th century. In this dawning era of new industrial print technologies, expanding communities of literacy, and widespread professionalization, negotiations of social need and deservingness that had once taken place in person were increasingly mediated by the printed word. Reformers devised new modes of bureaucratic documentation to ascertain who had earned the help they sought, while charity seekers navigated a tangle of industrial print to prove their commitment to work. The goal for all parties was the same, putting a new spin on an old ambition, capturing the inherent meaningfulness of work on the page. I call this largely forgotten archive, the print culture of social welfare. And I use this phrase to encompass the wealth of industrial print genres that were used to mediate between individuals and institutions of social welfare from the late 19th century onwards. The book focuses on four genres in particular, one chapter each, casework, pension claims, motion studies, and work songs. And I'd be happy to talk about each of these in turn during the Q&A, but first a few words about the print culture of social welfare. So formally speaking, the wide ranging print culture of social welfare was shaped by the narrow concept of disability inherited from the poor law tradition. As disability studies scholars have shown, there are countless ways to approach disability as such, whether it's lived experience, cultural identity, political minority, or medical diagnosis. But from the colonial era onward, disability in US social welfare provision was defined as, quote, an incapacitation for manual labor, end quote. To be disabled meant to be exempted from the obligation to work, although not from the stigma of dependency. In this way, the disability category sorted, served as a crucial sorting function. It determined who belonged in the work-based system of social distribution and who could be exempted from work into the needs-based system of social welfare. So broad was the disability category's explanatory power, in fact, that it also shaped how the print culture of social welfare made sense of the volatile relations among citizenship, race, and labor in the late 19th century. As people of color faced ever new forms of economic discipline and disenfranchisement, they were also conscripted into the vast networks of writing that charity officials, reformers, and government agencies compiled in the name of social welfare. At base, these documents adapted the questions at the crux of the disability category, 
Would formerly enslaved people, imperial subjects, and immigrants work for wages? And how could they be integrated into the labor market? Racial and ethnic difference thus entered the print culture of social welfare as barriers to productive citizenship under the sign of disability. To recap then, the textual project of representing work as the truest sign of social deservingness began with the new industrial print genres used to mediate between individuals and institutions in the latter half of the 19th century. These genres were in turn shaped by the overlapping histories of economic and racial discipline that the disability category brought into relation. But while the documentary genres that constitute the print culture of social welfare originated in institutional and social contexts, they rarely stayed there. The forms used to reinforce the moral self-evidence of work in one milieu or discourse were just as often taken up in another, crisscrossing ostensibly discrete fields like public administration, economic planning, social science, and even literature and the arts. Tracking these circuitous trajectories across the turn of the 20th century reveals the representational labor that went into making work seem naturally meaningful. But doing so also suggests that the print culture of social welfare was not always a top-down affair. Official genres also provided prompts for vernacular improvisation, creating what we might call a bureaucratic fake book with which people on the economic and social margins could might rethink, remake, or even refuse the model of economic citizenship they were offered. So each of the chapters in the book follows roughly the same structure. After detailing the history and context in which a particular pent genre came to mediate between individuals and social welfare institutions, it moves to recover a forgotten history of reappropriation. So what might this, re this history of reappropriation look like in practice? You can take as an example, one genre, Pardon me. From the first chapter, the genre of the pension claim. The focus here is on the Civil War invalid pension claim, the bureaucratic genre that disabled veterans used to prove not just that they had been wounded in the course of their service, but more importantly, that they had truly earned the support that the state had given them, thus the right to be exempted from the workforce. What began life as a narrative genre of life writing released by the US Pension Bureau, however, soon found much broader traction. Disabled veterans used the pension claim not only to access benefits and support, but also to tell their stories. And this was particularly important for black disabled veterans whose contributions to the Civil War were already being written out of the historical record shortly thereafter. But the genre of the Civil War invalid pension claim was also crucial to the earliest movement for reparations that began in the 1890s, which was itself known as the ex-slave pension movement. For Black activists like Callie D. House and Isaiah Dickerson, the most direct way to make reparations a reality was to add the names of formerly enslaved people to the roles of the Civil War veterans already receiving benefits. The argument was that formerly enslaved people had, like Civil War veterans, earned the support of the state. The book's first chapter looks not only at how ex-slave pension associations made use of the Civil War invalid pension claim, but also how applicants in a wide range of contexts interrogated the social fiction at the heart of the genre. At base, this largely forgotten body of writing by formerly enslaved people at the turn of the century reflects on and interrogates the relations among and between injury, work, and compensation, often to unexpected ends. So this is the story told in the book's first chapter. The other three chapters focus on three other genres taken from the print culture of social welfare, the case, motion study, and the work song. Taken together, the book's four chapters don't offer an exhaustive or strictly representative accounting of the print culture of social welfare. The story I tell is less a comprehensive portrait of social welfare provision at the beginning of the 20th century than an effort to parse a representational project that extends from that earlier era into our own. Ultimately though, work requirements is an exercise in recovery that shows how people persist through and even by means of the tools created to contain them. Such is the value, I think, of the print culture of social welfare today. <laughs> 
the stories written on the margins of these bureaucratic genres can help us understand the representational effort that goes into making work seem inherently meaningful, but they also ask us to think with them about how we might imagine social welfare and the social more generally beyond or even without work. I'll stop there. Thank you. Professor Tani, would you like to engage? Professor yes, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I'll say first, I love the book. If you haven't um, read the book, you know, pick it up. Here's my well-loved copy of it. Um, I think the first question that I wanted to ask Todd is to elaborate a little bit more on the, on the choices at the base of the chapters. So as Todd mentioned, each chapter has sort of a similar argumentative structure, but they rely on um, very different types of sources. So I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the choices that you made in terms of what body of sources to anchor particular chapters. And maybe we haven't talked about this previously, but are there sources that you considered that didn't make it into the book for whatever reason, but that you found, you know, enlightening at the time that you were doing the research? Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's one of the one of the challenges of writing an interdisciplinary book is figuring out how to define what it is actually you're looking at. So this book, I think, is you know to 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 repeat the argument, it's looking about wanting to understand sort of the ideology behind social welfare provision in the U.S., but thinking about how this is a representational project. It's not only that you have to work, you have to show that you're working. And so that question of how does work actually get shown is something that was really interesting to me. And I saw this cropping up in lots of different places. So a lot of these, a lot of the, the materials I was looking at were particular institutions, right? So the first chapter on the pension, um, the pension claim, that document is existing. It existed, came into being to mediate between disabled Civil War veterans and the, the state. And that was that mediation of the in-betweenness that was so interesting to me. But that, that, that chapter itself actually kind of became a model for the rest of the book because that genre just didn't stay in its place. It circulated everywhere, it was popular. You can see it across the literature of the time being represented. So canonical literature, folks like Mark Twain engaging with it. And so I was really interested in how that one kind of discrete form that had a very bureaucratic, very particular kind of, um, of life went into these other different sorts of contexts. So that for me really kind of painted what I what I felt was the story I wanted to tell was how these these particular genres that aren't would you know I, I I was trained as a literary scholar and ended up writing a book about genres that do not feel literary at all but that have these kind of extra these literary afterlives where they're being used to to, to much different purposes and so that was I was actually more interested in sort of the circulation and so something like the Civil War pension claim begins as this bureaucratic genre if it's taken in lots of different I mean I traced it through musicals through um through life writing I, I argue in, the, in that chapter it was the most lucrative mode of autobiography in the 19th century because there's a lot writing on it if you could if you could successfully write in that genre you can you can be awarded a pension in particular and perhaps not have to work um, for the rest of your life so that became sort of the model for for the um for the rest of the rest of the chapters, each of which looks at a particular kind of location, institution of social welfare, and what was the particular kind of writing. And again, the backdrop here is that there's an explosion of industrial print culture in the late 19th century, where before printing was was much more um, expensive, was much more cumbersome. Now print is cheap. Every it's these trinkets and ephemeral. Um, ephemeral documents are really spreading throughout culture and there's not a there's not a, a civic organization in American life that isn't using tickets that isn't using forms of some kind or other to really to um to bring people into a relationship with with um, one another and so this is certainly a part of the this history of social welfare and so I wanted to really kind of capture that but also think about put pressure on um categories like the bureaucratic the literary the um, the non literary what is what is merely formal what is boring I think it's more into sort of the circulation and so the other two chapters uh, the book sort of gets progressively kind of more not freewheeling but it's I'm willing to engage with histories of uh, sort of say photography and the photography of um, 
people with disabilities that I think it's fed into early histories of cinema. So this idea of wanting to trace the motion of people, being able to understand how people move, what is proper movement, what is improper movement, they could then use to determine what counts as work, what does really efficient labor look like, what does inefficient labor look like, that's at the heart of early cinema. So all of these stories are really kind of intertwined. And so part of what I, what I, um, I do there is to really track that intertwining. But at the end of the day, I'm also really interested in, as I said at the end of my, my remarks, I'm really interested in getting to the writing that's kind of on the margins, that's happening there that wouldn't have access to an audience, but it's still a form of, of really meaningful self-representation. And I think it, there, there are chapters in this book that are really explicitly concerned with new archives, what we call, could call Black disability writing, writing that's happening on the margins of these sort of more disciplinary forms by people who would not have access to other kinds of writing. Thank you. That was really that was really helpful. I wanted to um, invite you to elaborate a little more on something that came up in your talk. But um, from a craft perspective, I find this really interesting. So you and I had talked in advance about this term print culture of social welfare. And I had asked, you know, is that is that your term? And you basically said, you know, in the process of writing the book, you realized you needed a, a, a term for this archive, this body of stuff that you were pulling together. And that term sort of didn't exist um, in the world. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about like when that term, when in the process of writing the book did that term occur to you? Like, was it early on and then that anchored your gathering process or did you gather and then you realize, oh, this is kind of the term that unites this, this universe. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit on, and I, I think you suggested that it's a kind of a term that's anchored in time because it has to do with when does print become cheap and readily accessible and lots of people are looking to um, printed forms to do to do work for them. Um, but I wondered like, it, you know, is there still a kind of print culture of social welfare or has that been overtaken by other media such that if somebody wanted mm -hmm. to write this book today, like would the archive be necessarily different? Like, would it be GoFundMe websites and TikTok videos? Or um, in other words, does the term, can the term um, do similar work today? Or is it really this turn, this turn of the 20th century term that sort of fits perfectly the body of material that you used for the book, but maybe kind of resides only in that, in that era? Right. Thank you. That's really, that's, that's really great to think with. I think on the end, so the, the, to answer the first question, I think basically it, it came late in the process. And so I found myself really, um, frankly, overwhelmed by the amount of writing that was being produced and that the, the kind of the, the bureaucratic hoops that folks were having to jump through, the paperwork that was involved. And I wanted to kind of make sense of it. It became pretty clear to me um, earlier in the process that the book was going to be about, it's about representation. As I moved away from the literary the questions of representation and how to represent work and what were the stakes of that representational project really came to the fore. But of course, as you can imagine, with that explosion of writing that's happening at this particular moment, um, there'd be just too much, right? And I didn't want this book to be um, comprehensive in that way. I also didn't want it to be like a small snapshot of this, of everything that was written about work. So for me, it became clear um, maybe three quarters of the way through writing the, the process of the book that what was linking all of the material that I was looking at was not that it was about work. It's certainly about work and about the value of work, but I wasn't, I was finding what was most interesting was not, you know, the statements that fill our culture even today about how valuable work is and how we need to have it for our, you know, our moral center and all of these kind of these very moral arguments about the power of work. But that's not the level of representation that I was really after and I saw that was most, was most interesting. It was that mediating role. There's something about writing that did something. This is the writing that you use either to represent your story, so a self-representation, that it wasn't about, the, the goal was not to be an, to have an accurate representation of what you were doing. The goal was to convince the person you were dealing with that what you're doing was work and should, should count. And then the interpretive labor on the other side to, to determine not whether or not, whether this is a good representation, whether um, they're you know, singing the appropriate payons to the moral power of, of, of work or the dignity of labor, but whether they're actually documenting and showing their work. And so that became kind of the, the crux for me is that is so mediation became the really key, the key phrase for me that these are works, these are documents, print artifacts that are about that mediate between individuals and institutions and do that work. So there's a lot of other work, other other representations in the the atmosphere, the universe of this book. 
there, I would say, are maybe more about work, about the power of work, and, you know, all of the moralizing around that, you think really like a more pedagogical project to convince everybody. But here I was interested in like, in that kind of moment of exchange and how text is making that exchange possible. And in, in, in the, the second question about the timeliness or the, the time, the boundedness of the, of the print culture of social welfare, I do think that what happens in this, this moment in the late 19th century certainly carries through, um, through much of the, um, much of the uh, early 20th century. I mean, and I certainly historians of the welfare state would argue that there's, argue that there's certainly something happening similar dynamic or representational project. I think that maybe there um, it becomes slightly more visual the later you go into the 20th century. And you think about, um, you know, the histories of, of, of welfare reform and like the man in the house rules. There's, there's something there about, um, those are the rules that um, if somebody were receiving benefits and were supposed to have been single, but there was a man in their house, they could be, they could be having the benefits taken away. That was, is very much about invasiveness as a, a spectator, uh, a surveillance. And so, um, and that carries over in today to what sociologists talk about um, street level bureaucracy. So the power of the bureaucratic interaction. And so I'm not sure paperwork is certainly part of that, but it's also more about that, the kind of inner, the sort of the moment of interaction when you're seeing a caseworker, that, 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 that the power dynamic in that exchange is a different kind of performance. I think it's certainly there, and it's, but it's moved maybe then it becomes more of a, the project of representing your deservingness becomes more about, um, physical comportment or adopting a certain kind of um, a certain kind of behavior, a set of attitudes or a look. It's less, less of a textual project. Thank you. The next question that I wanted to ask was about, um, so two words that are in the title of the book are race and disability. And I think that your argument about what these terms, what these concepts do and their relationship to each other is really sophisticated and nuanced and maybe kind of can't be captured in a in a sound bite but i wondered if you could elaborate for this audience the relationship that you see between disability and race via work and what you would most want them to to take away like if there is a message about race and disability that this that this work offers how would you sum that up briefly if you're up to the challenge sure i'll, I'll give it a shot um, I think it might be helpful to just take one step back and to consider um, one, of the, one of the more common framings of race and disability in this period in the, early, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. There's been a lot of really important work um, done by scholars in um, sort of the first and second waves of disability studies to think about how race and disability are linked. But there's a, the, 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 the linking term of the frame, the prism is not labor, like it is for my book. It has to do more kind of spectacle of performance of abjection and that difference and that emphasis on sort of the spectacle. So the sites that folks usually, some of the most important early work that was being done in this area was thinking about places like the, um, so the visual economies of the the freak show, for instance, or um, and slavery with the you know the um, um, we could think about you know even the origins of of Jim the word the phrase Jim Crow, which began on the minstrel stage, is another really important place for thinking about how race and disability were linked through cultures of performance. That um, Jim Crow was a disabled slave who um, the earliest min white minstrels saw um, dancing and adopted that practice as their own. So there's really lots of really important um, recovery work being done around that to, to, to think about how race and disability are being linked in that moment on the one hand is kind of through the spectacle of abjection or black-faced minstrelsy, this kind of degradation of blackness through disability, but a lot of really important work being done um, by Black disability activists to reclaim that history as well, and to think about think about Jim Crow as a really important um, kind of cultural figure, someone who was um, bringing sort of disabled art and culture and dance to the popular stage, where it was mis it was misinterpreted and it was used in much different ways. So that's the kind that economy of like of spectacle, race, disability, abjection on the stage. So I think how we usually think about race and disability being linked during this period. Can add on top of that, of course, histories of eugenics um, that are that are um, a little bit a little earlier for this moment, but certainly in the offering. 
so I think all of that is really important context and my book is really engaged with those histories um, at key points. But I'm also interested in thinking about how when we think about race and disability through the lens of labor, we get to see a, a, a really different kind of configuration. And there when we see how um, disability was defined in these institutional contexts, not through the lens of abjection or spectacle, uh, or even the visual had to do with an incapacitation for manual labor, then you can see how it became this sort of crucial sorting category. Here I'm building on a lot of work um, done by um, important historians of the welfare state and feminist historians of the welfare state in particular to think about how that question of who was deserving and who was not had to do with the question of labor. And so the disability category then, this comes from, I sort of gave a nod to it in, in, the, in my remarks here, but it's a, it's a sort of an Elizabethan concept that has to do with the folks who um, could be exempted from having to work, who've been giving certificates saying they could beg on the street, be, exist in that kind of, that um, what I call the, that mode of social distribution. That was the mode of disability meant. It was a label that allowed you to exist outside of work. And so by thinking about how this came together in the late 19th century, through this, this, this textual production, we get to see, I think, a, a totally different history. So that's history is still impacts how the, the, the further development of the welfare state, I think it's very important to, to, to note, but also given that my background as a literary scholar and a cultural historian, I think this is where we see folks who, uh, black disabled, young people in, in, in black industrial schools, for instance, finding a place for themselves and being writing in these genres that were made to interrogate that the disability category. So there's a whole wealth of writing and cultural production that's happening not on the, the, the minstrel stage, not on the freak show circuit, that's still there and very important. So there's this other kind of body of writing and cultural production that when we shift the view to think of, to make work the central category, that this really comes to, to, to light. Thank you. And again, I encourage everyone to read the book to get that. It's a very, I think, nuanced um, argument, but that was terrific. I think I have time for one more question before we open things up. I wanted to ask a little bit more about, you had mentioned how in each chapter, there's sort of, you know, two facets of it. And one facet of it is sort of more um, this kind of subversive recovery work. It's um, it's showing kind of reappropriation of these textual forms sometimes. So for example, the sort of reappropriation of the form of the pension claim, it's a, um, often a kind of forgotten history, like a less told, less familiar to historians. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about um, the kind of world making or world imagining that you see happening in those parts of the, the chapter and the relationship to work. So in a prior conversation, I think you had clarified, you know, this isn't, we might be tempted to kind of read into that a sort of anti-work sensibility, right? Like a, an, a, an ideal kind of imagining a world beyond work where so much of our, you know, our worth and our benefits don't flow through work. But I think you say that that's not necessarily what was happening. Sometimes it was just people who were locked out of that world trying to kind of imagine a way into the worthy category. So yeah. can you say a little bit more about kind of the forgotten histories um, facet of this book, which um, which I really loved? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the constant tension of trying to be wanting, recovering this, this, this body of writing, it's happening on the margins, but on the other, because it's by virtue of being in the margins, it is often, um, it's trying, a lot of these writers are, are trying frantically to, to, to find their way in. And work becomes a way of, of doing that. And so I think on the one hand, there, there are some, some cases where I do feel like there's a, an emergent, a nascent anti-work politics that is, that's on the, on, the, um, on the cusp here. And so the, the, the coda of the book sort of pushes that forward, wants to really see this history as maybe, maybe pushing us towards thinking about universal basic income, right? And the, the other, these the sort of anachronistic forms that we have for talking about um, what, what was maybe nascent in these earlier histories. But I do think it's important to understand that, um, I guess there's something so um, mixed or so kind of unclear that on the one hand, it's to be, it's hard to be outside of this, 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 this society that values work above all else, but there also, there's different ways of defining work or having what you, what the performances of, of work um, that you're engaging in, have them, having them recognized as work when they might not be in another context. So there is something about whose work counts 
that I think is also part of a broader conversation about why why work itself should count. And so sometimes, even within the, the course of a single chapter, there'd be some folks who'd be using it a, a, a genre to um, to to actually sort of shore up the work society and say, hey, you know, what we're doing is work too, and we should really recognize that, and that's our way in. Because economic citizenship for people with disabilities, for African Americans, was hugely important. You know, at the end of the 19th century, it was. Um, you know, um, the one way that 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 many folks were able to imagine sort of participation. But I think that in in sort of exploring that and in trying to define that on their own terms, there are those moments that push beyond it and thinking about work uh, in different terms or even beyond work and just make it a little bit more concrete. In the first chapter about the pension claims, when the that the genre of the pension claim moves um, was taken up by black activists in the earliest reparation movements, the ex-slave pension movement, um, some of the arguments that are made are incredibly work-based to say to, to go so far as to say slavery um, slavery was work. we should be paid. So reparations as back as back pay. Other folks were less comfortable with that analogy and wanted to kind of explode it. And then the the last two images that I showed were these what I um, kind of theorizes or sort of like a speculative archive where those are the letters that um, everyday um, men and women wrote to the pension department asking, are, is there a real thing? Can we, can, can, um, is reparations happening? Just that, that search for information. It was also kind of questioning what is, you know, what's the experience that these people went through? Can that be compensated? What does the logic of compensation even hold there? And in those kind of more fleeting moments, that I think are so that one genre is 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 reappropriated in ways that are shoring up the work society, but also are pushing at its seams and um, and trying to imagine something slightly different, even for just you know flickering moments here and there. So it is kind of it's a, it's a it's hard to step outside of the work society, and there are moments. And I think this this archive, the print culture of social welfare, shows people grappling with this these questions and making kinds of. Um, negotiations on what would work best for them in the moment to live within the work society of the present. Thank you. Um, the audience is um, invited to comment or ask questions. And perhaps as um, the members of the audience are gathering thoughts, I can ask one simple question. Um, so I'm wondering how in this era of hybrid work, which is so much entangled with childcare and housework, um, in this era of hybrid work, how the moral or ethical valence, surveillances of, of labor work have been changed in your view? Yeah, I mean, I think if, yeah, actually that sort of dovetails really nicely the conversation we were just having and thinking about, on the one hand, I think some a lesson, important lesson that we've learned is to value things like childcare and domestic labor as work and to say this is actually really important we should be taking this very seriously and um but that on the one that is also so there's a, a um kathy weeks is a um a feminist theorist of, of labor um works at duke university has um Shown that, that that kind of traditional feminist argument about wanting to take child work and child care and domestic labor seriously um, is in itself kind of inevitably shoring up the, the work society and saying, still not, we're still thinking work is important. So to find something is important because it is work is not to step outside of that system. Um, that's just, again, it's super vexed, right? Because we all want the extra labor that we're all doing to be recognized. And the other, but the other side of that is that it does, it does sort of push us to beyond to think about um, all of this extra labor we're putting in to work. Maybe that's not worth it. Maybe there's other things we could be doing with our time and maybe, you know, spending time with our families as opposed to, um, to you know, going through the motions to do what we have to do, or maybe even to reducing what we have to do to make our livings. Um, to its barest so that we can have time for other things. So I think that really gets at the um, that kind of the vexedness of it. On the one hand, wanting to claim what we do is work and have that be important for that reason, but also maybe wanting to work less. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Tani, do you have further comments or? I'm happy to, um, to ask some more questions. I mean, Todd, one thing that occurred to me just during this talk, but not so much reading the book is that 
I think reading the book, I had thought, okay, this book is about showing that all work is inherently meaningful. You know, even the kind of drudgery, like like you said, even the sort of make work, the welfare to work, you know, the searching for work, like all, making sure that all of that is meaningful. But in this talk, it also occurred to me that part of what you're showing is um, the project of making clear that some work, some tasks that people want to call work is not work, right? It gets excluded from um, the category. Um, so maybe can you elaborate a little bit more on, you know, the project of making some work not count as work? Like what's going on there? Like what does that serve? Is that just a way of funneling people towards work that we would prefer that they do? Um, and also maybe you could speak to like, what is the danger if we don't believe that certain like make work is not meaningful? Like if we reveal it as just drudgery, right? Like what is the fear? What could happen? Yeah. I mean, I think, so the, so two questions there. The first, like what is, what gets excluded from, from work? I feel like that's, that's, it really cuts to the core of the fantasy that we're working with here. If, if work is the essential core of all of our beings and that work everyone should have access to work and everyone can have a meaningful life because they can work. It doesn't matter what they do, all work is inherently meaningful. There's something, and this actually speaks then to the earlier conversation about people in the book really wanting to hold on to that. But there's something, um, there's something sort of radical about that. There's something very egalitarian about that, right? So this, is the, this is the fantasy of economic citizenship that, um, and this was the position that this is why I think black industrial education figures so prominently in the book is because that was an accommodationist strategy that said we're going to, you know, we're going to park um, civil rights um, projects for now, right? Right now we're going to focus on economic citizenship because that's what seems, you know, given all of the, you know, the racist violence that's happening at the time, that's what seems possible. And so there is that, that, that fantasy then, right? Um, but certainly that's why there are so many, so many white backers of black industrial education, right? It's that fantasy that, that this was the way of, of imagining um, at the moment um, racial progress for African-Americans. But of course, right, that funneling that you're talking about is the funneling to certain kinds of work. And so there's something, the flip side of that, of course, is that the, the fantasy of, of um, economic citizenship is incredibly white, right? And so the folks who can have that freedom to choose what kind of work and to have work um, that is maybe more meaningful. I'm actually, so I'm in Berlin right now and there's a, a great phrase um, that was used in, the, in East Germany. Um, friends told me, said that, um, you know, back in the day during communist East Germany, everyone was equal. Some people were just more equal than others. And I feel like that's, that, that applies here, right? That all work is meaningful, but some work is more meaningful than other work. And that kind of funneling is a way of having other priorities take precedence having to do, you know, this is where it overlaps with histories of um, sort of early African-American um, freedom movements of the early 20th century, histories of immigration, all of that organized around this one kind of universal principle of work. But the, that's, that unwinds the, the um, or it, it unravels the, uh, the, the more you pull on that thread. And in terms of the danger of, of make work, I feel like we're, this is something that we're really grappling with today. Like we, we are facing, this is, the, this is what the threat of automation represents. That if there's a lot of work that we could be doing without having people do it, um, why, why not? And the idea is there's, so there's respectability arguments, moralizing arguments, what are people gonna be doing? How can people imagine life if they don't have work? And so the, the, you know, the, the fantasies of, of dissipation, a great 19th, late 19th century work, right? Of people just going to pot and to um, an unraveling, social, the social fabric unraveling. It's a really, it betrays a real lack of imagination, but there are many other ways that we can be defining our lives and if work were not the center, if we got rid of meaningful, meaning, uh, this, this make work as being, um, forcing people who um, don't have access to other kinds of labor into these, this, this make work situations, that everything would just would just would just, would just would just collapse. But I think actually we're seeing, and certainly in the pandemic, with the rise of mutual aid societies, other kinds of structural formations, other ways of getting things done and caring for each other, that these systems were already there, ready to take on and sort of give meaning to our lives in ways that um, work we make that we, that sort of labor we outsource to work. That's there. It's the kid. We we have these other ways of defining 
our lives if we were just like clear a little bit of space and make work seems like one place to just to do that to get rid of the, that kind of labor may i ask a quick question mm -hmm. um i think you um have touched upon it in the talk today and you've um um discuss it at, at greater length in your book but can you just quickly i'm not sure if quick is the right word tell us about um how how in what in the western philosophical tradition dissipation is has been related to non-economic work mm -hmm. so do you mean sort of the, the fear of of people kind of unraveling or the fear of or maybe the religions of religions mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah yeah i mean part of the part of this book was um the, you know this is the the the, the struggle of interdisciplinarity is having to um get up to speed on lots of different fields to be able to bring things together and so one of the there are a couple of many different fields this, this book is bringing together disability studies african-american studies american studies history of the welfare state and then there are these fantastic histories of of labor and so part of what the, the introduction of the book has to do is to think about was work always meaningful um and you know the, the story i tell the genealogy i give is to say no it wasn't always meaningful. Uh, there were times actually early on and you know the historians of labor would point us to um, plato and to aristotle thinking about work as a curse and that we should be um spending our times philosoph philosophizing and thinking about other things as opposed to just engaging in work. And it wasn't really then the, 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 the moment that folks usually point to is the Reformation and thinking there about how work goes from being toil and drudgery to being a sign of, of showing that you have been, you're a member of the elect and that um, work is being done now for the, for the, for the good of God. So I think that the, the, if there's a tie there to dissipation, I guess it has to do with the sense that if one weren't following one's Weberian calling, or you know, the if one weren't um, doing work for the glory of God, then when, then that kind of life is inherently fallen. That kind of life is not um, is not going to lead one to the to the kingdom of heaven. And so there's a there's a, a real desire there to um, for work to um, allow you to kind of prove that you have. Um, you are a member of the elect, that you have that kind of future to look forward to, and that you have that sort of moral value. And so I guess that would be a good place to kind of think about where dissipation really begins. And I think it'd be interesting then to think about the fear of not being among the elect, the fear of not um, you know, doing enough work to honor um, God as being then related to the folks who are outside of God's grace, and then basically, um, racial difference and whiteness. And I think those categories, that's the sort of, you know, the, the secularization uh, thesis notwithstanding, there's still something there about that fear of like being um, damned and that fear of not being white. There's something there. I think it's, it's linked to the category of, of, of labor as well. Thank you, that was very helpful. Professor Tani, would you like to continue for a couple more minutes? I, I would love the chance to continue. So one thing that fascinates me about this book is um, these kind of like intermediary figures who are kind of, I would describe them as like the gatekeepers of work in some ways, right? It's kind of these, um, the social workers, for example, or the, the, you know, the bureaucrats who are reviewing the pension claims. And I think a kind of, you know, um, a theme throughout the chapters is, you know, you, you these people are real kind of characters in the book and some of what's happening for them is they're doing tasks that perhaps were not always recognized as work, but yeah. a sort of professionalization is happening in this exact same time period. So for example, these people that might once have been thought of as like charity workers, and often they were women, you know, suddenly they're getting professional recognition and it's in part like their work is recognized as work and it's part through being gatekeepers of work. So I wondered if you wanted to say a little bit more about that category of actor, and maybe this is a space to think a little bit more about gender, which is a category mm -hmm. that's, you know, didn't make the title of the book, but I think that you're very cognizant of and you have a lot to, to say yeah. about. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So this, you know, just to think about this for the grand historical argument of the book, this moment of the late 19th century, where this explosion of industrial print culture, 
that's happening in part, well, for lots of different reasons, technological reasons and, and others, but a lot of it is this drive towards professionalization, that a lot of uh, careers that before were maybe more ad hoc, they were locally based. Um, you know, this is uh, the moment when um, Medical education is being formalized in the United States. Legal education is being formalized, right? All of these kinds of ways of proving your work that I am somebody who does this kind of work. I am someone who does this kind of work. And those are, there's, it's professional organizations are inherently gatekeeping, right? You belong or you don't belong. You're a professional or you're an amateur. And so print culture is, uh, is, is making these distinctions um, possible as well. And so in the book, I mean, part of the story is, you know, we think of, you know, social welfare provision today, and we think of faceless bureaucrats, we think of anonymous institutions, but, um, you know, it's earlier histories in the U.S., and actually, this is still more the case in the U.S. than in a lot of other countries, that it belongs to the private sector. This is, these are, volu this is volunteerism. This is folks looking out, there's a big sort of, there's another, maybe another religious dimension there that a lot of the social welfare work fell on religious communities. It fell on communities as such, right? Taking care of your own. And that was sort of a very kind of family oriented, amateurish, um, and I don't mean that with a negative valence, but there's something sort of tight knit, close, where you didn't necessarily, you could do these sorts of things in person. And so as the country is growing, expanding, those kinds of connections aren't as possible any longer. And so paperwork comes in to mediate that. And so what that has is on the one hand, um, it's kind of like a stopgap solution because you have these, some people, there's a lot of nostalgia for how things used to be, right? The tight knit communities that kept it, kept care of everybody and no one, no one, uh, everyone was pay, paid for. And we're still kind of working with this in this, this mindset today and thinking about should the state be the, the, the basis of social welfare or should communities be the basis of social welfare? But what's happening at this moment as social welfare itself is becoming a profession. And so we see this in the, um, in the, the bureaucrats who are running the pension um, program. We see this in the histories of social casework. Um, and the big part of the book is the history of, of um, philanthropy and foundation philanthropy that's becoming um, professionalized. And a lot of that is being driven by the same sort of anxieties. Like, are you somebody who is just a, um, a, uh, a kind-hearted do-gooder? Are you driven by sentimentality? Or are you driven by rational execution? Are you driven by, are you being effective? And you can see even that language of moving from the sentimental to the rational, the, to, to the effective, right? To, um, there's a history to be traced here also from, um, yeah, from what in the book, uh, this movement is, is called scientific charity to what we're now calling effective altruism, right? The idea that it shouldn't be how you feel about something, but you think someone is really deserving because it tugs at your heartstrings. It's because you've done the math, you know what it is, you've calculated it out. This is someone who really deserves and it's gonna be effective. It's gonna, it's gonna make uh, for change. But even in the, that vocabulary, scientific charity, sentimentality, rational calculation, effectiveness, it's very gendered. And so it's this against the, this is happening all against the backdrop that social welfare provision was largely based in families. It was largely run by women who were on the front line. And so what's what's happening in this professionalization of wanting to claim work, the work of social welfare as work, means um, leaving behind some of the associations with um, with women. And so it's puts. That's not to say that women, of course, are professionalized at the same time. But it's it's they're 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 moving from one sector where their work was explicitly feminized to another sector when where the, the work that women are doing is 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 seen in more masculine, more rational terms. So that's yeah, I think a big a big part of the of the book. Thank you. I think we're approaching the end of our hour, um, unless Professor Tani has some last comments. We might conclude here. Thank you both for a fascinating discussion and thank you so much for writing this very important book. And we look forward to your next one. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.